Okay, we'll be uh, discussing chapter 10 today, biotechnology. Um, <clears throat> what does biotechnology involve? Uh, cloning and genetic engineering would be an example of uh, biotechnology. Isolation of nucleic acid, it all starts with that. Cells are lysed and then using detergent and salt, that, detergent that disrupts the plasma membrane and combined with then treat it with protease and RNAs that get to destroy proteins and protein, proteins and RNA. Then it's centrifuge to isolate the supernatant, separates to debris and supernatant like that. And then DNA is precipitated using ethanol. Uh, you have done this in the lab. Think about which step this involves. Um, I worked in HCV research and HCV is an RNA virus, virus. So you don't treat it with RNAs because that'll kill the RNAs, but other steps are very similar. And you can't even see anything because uh, there is so little of it. More on this later. And DNA, to analyze the DNA, then uh, gel electrophoresis is used. DNA is, DNA is negatively charged at neutral pH. So it'll move in an electric field. And the gel comb, we call it, or I guess you can't really see it here. It'll create the well uh, in a molten uh, agarose gel. Uh, think of it as a jello that's slightly harder. And it solidifies as, as it cools. And then we use the well to load the DNA prior to uh, applying the electric field. And then DNA molecules are separated by size with smaller molecules moving fast. Remember the uh, paper chromatography on uh, photosynthetic pigments. Orange carotene moved farther than green chlorophyll. Why is that? You should come, you should ponder that. Uh, also, it you use the uh, UV light to view because it's been stained, as we call it, with ethereum bromide. And uh, ethereum bromide intercalates between uh, DNA base pairs. And here's a shape of inner uh, ethereum bromide. And here's the ethereum bromide actually intercalated with the DNA. Here are the bases. Look how flat that is. And remember the glow germ lotion experiment? That was the UV light you used. Then polymerase chain reaction, what is that? DNA analysis often requires specific region of the genome to be analyzed. And in some cases, only few copies of the DNA molecule is available, like in virus research, forensics, crime lab, and so on. So the polymerase chain reaction is used to exponentially increase the number of copies of specific region of DNA. Imagine doubling at each step. There are uh, four steps or four things. One, you have to denature at 95 degrees, anneal at 50 degree, you have to anneal the primer. Remember in DNA synthesis replication, you the cell uses RNA primer, but here we use DNA primer and extend at 72 to two degrees. This is the uh, replication step. And repeat these three steps for 20 to, 20 to 30 cycles. Those are the four things you have to do. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 done is also done using the same uh, PCR uh, reaction, except with an added step of reverse transcription, because uh, SARS-CoV-2 is an RNA virus, just like uh, HCV. Note the RNA polymerase is killed because it's a protein at 95 degrees. It's why why does egg white turn white? Because proteins are denatured. So if PCR uh, machine does this all on its own, cycling through three different temperatures for 20 to 30 cycles, why doesn't the enzyme die? Here's a thermal vent shown here uh, next to the PCR machine. Thermal vent has led to discovery of this organism called, a uh, microorganism called Thermus aquaticus, TAC. And the DNA polymerase isolated from this organism, which is called a TAC. And prior to the discovery of TAC, and this TAC DNA polymerase resists, does not get denatured at this temperature because it has so many cysteine bridges. And before the discovery of TAC, Carrie Mullis, 
who invented the PCR used to add E. coli DNA polymerase at every single DNA, after every single denaturant step. It was a very expensive procedure. And so what does it allow us to do? It allows, uh, cloning allows for the creation of multiple copies of the gene, the expression of the gene, and the study of specific genes. Uh, remember in micro section, we talked about plasmids being part of, uh, natu being naturally inside the bacteria. And many of these plasmids has, have been uh, modified to allow insertions of foreign DNA fragment into it by using restriction sites. Here's an example of restriction site. And the restriction enzymes recognize specific DNA sequences and cut them exactly as they're meant to, always. It doesn't make an error. And so this sequence here, GGATCC, is a BAMH1 site. And it cuts the DNA like this. And note how forward sequence is identical to backward sequence, five prime to three prime, five prime to three, three prime. This is what we call pal palindromic sequences. And most of the uh, restriction enzyme sites are palindromic. And because it creates a sticky end with a single strand overhang, this is what we call single strand overhang. Overhang doesn't have matched base pairs. So it can allow annealing, self-annealing of the plasmid or insertion of different fragment into that area. This is a different, it's the same sticky end from different foreign DNA fragment. This is gonna line up there. And then you use the ligase to join the H bond fragments. So that's, uh, that process is shown in a little more detail here. So the plasmid has two things. It has ampicillin resistance gene. So the growth medium down here will have ampicillin in it. And then it also has functioning LACZ gene. And LACZ gene will turn a chemical that you include in the growth media blue. Okay. And the restriction site is located within the LACZ gene. Uh, so, uh, so that yeah, recombinant DNA is DNA with foreign DNAs, like a plasmid, <clears throat> with foreign DNA inserted in it. <clears throat> then you can produce recombinant proteins. And so, the, this plasmid has, like I said, inside the restriction site, inside the LACZ protein that turns the blue cells blue normally, <clears throat> and ampicillin resistance gene. If a foreign DNA gets placed inside the LACZ gene, LACZ gene loses function, meaning it's not going to turn cells into blue. If and only if a foreign DNA has been inserted into the sticky sites like this. So cut to do this, cut both the foreign DNA and plasmid with the same exact uh, restriction enzyme to produce, produce the same sticky ends. Then either plasmid will H bond by itself, self anneal, or it'll combine with a foreign DNA fragment with the same restriction sites. <clears throat> then you ligate the DNA and you put it inside the bacteria. Then it will be selected using ampicillin to kill off ones that didn't take any plasmid. And if it has the insert, LACZ will be broken and turns uh, cells will remain white. <clears throat> and that's shown, that process is shown here. This is how you select for plasmids that has the foreign DNA inserted in it and you amplify it using the bacteria. <clears throat> and you can insert any genes, any enzymes using this method. And then there's the reproductive cloning. The reproductive cloning is making a clone or identical copy of an entire organism. Uh, contribution, remember, remember animals sexually reproduce and require to have two parents 
And so it's virtually impossible to make a, a identical copy of an entire animal or clone of either either parent or even a siblings. And Dolly the sheep was the first and agricultural animal to be cloned successfully. To what they did is they removed the nucleus from the donor egg. That's called the enucleation. And this is the cytoplasmic donor. And then you put that next to a mammary cell. This is the nuclear donor cell, like this. And then they applied the direct electricity shock. And then these two cells fused and became one. And then these fused cells were shocked again. And that caused the formation of blastocyst. Remember, blastocyst forms from blastula. And it has the inner cell mass in here. That's the, those are the stem cells. And blastocyst was transplanted into surrogate mother. And then it was matured and Dolly was born. And it turned out that uh, Dolly died relatively young because these, the nucleus was old. Obviously it's old because it's an adult animal. <laughs> and in uh, medicine and agriculture, biotechnology is also uh, useful. Genetic diagnosis used to detect presence of deleterious alleles known to, ca uh, known to cause diseases. For instance, BRCA gene mutation increases breast cancer risk. Uh, so the patient with uh, patients with history of cancer are often screened for these mutations. And genetic tests with, can also be done on fetuses using amniotic fluid or mother's blood, but not as accurate, but less risk to the fetus, obviously. And gene therapy may one day be used to cure certain genetic diseases. Simplest case it involves introducing non-mutated version of the gene into the genome of the patient. And then non-mutated gene ex will express the functional protein, then the obviously, uh, then the, the condition that causes the disease has been cured. We've done this many times using knockout and transgenic uh, studies. Um, and, yeah, and in order to introduce the non-mutated gene into the patient, you need a vector or carrier of the gene. And some people have proposed using adenovirus, which typically infects the cells and deliver its genome into the host DNA. It actually integrates it. It goes inside the host DNA and combines it. And this has been used for, uh, has been used as a uh, vector for gene therapy in, uh, I think in mice and in cells cell cultures. So modified adenovirus uh, carrying the non-mutated genes infects the cells. Then virus inside the cell breaks down its capsid, releases releases the DNA, as shown here. And then eventually the DNA, adenovirus DNA with uh, carrying a useful gene gets integrate, integrated into the host genome. Then that could potentially cure the condition that stem from mutated genes. Production of vaccines, antibiotics, hormones are all a result of advances in biotechnology. So for instance, pathogenic genes can be cloned into a vector and then mass produce the proteins that can be used as vaccines. And antibiotics can also be grown in mass and fungal cells, modified for that purpose. Antibiotics, remember, are organic compounds, usually from uh, fungal cells. And insulin, which is a peptide hormone regulating glucose levels, was first mass produced by E. coli in 1978. Before that, porcine or pig insulin was used. And many peptide growth hormones involved in diseases could potentially be made that way. Uh, and transgenic animals, they're used to study functions of different proteins. Some, some recombinant, many, on virtually all recombinant proteins can be produced in bacteria. But remember how the gene expression is controlled, regulated. It involves post-translational modifications. And some proteins need eukaryotic host in order for that proper processing to occur. 
And genes have been cloned and expressed in animals like sheep, goats, chicken, mice. And these are all called transgenic animals. Here's an example of tra transgenic animals. Mice. This one is expressing nothing. These two are expressing the green fluorescent proteins. And, oh, and before that, um, the FDA have has approved a blood coagulant protein to be produced in the milk of transgenic goats to be used in humans. <clears throat> so the, these mice are expressing the green fluorescent protein. I lost my mice, where is my mice? No. Green fluorescent protein. That's why it's fluorescing green. And they are under the promoter that is expressed in the ear, eye, and the snout. And maybe some in the back. I can sort of see it, but but mainly in the in these areas. And tissue specific expression of genes often is controlled by the promoter sequences. And uh yeah, I I've personally worked in a lab that knocked out collagen, thrombospondin, syndicans, heparin sulfate, prote proteoglycans. All of these are extracellular matrix proteins. Remember, extracellular matrix are in the interstitial fluid or interstitial space where the interstitial fluid forms the lymph, where uh, lymph lymphocytes are located. And this drains where? Lymph drains into the heart. Um, and then there are the transgenic plants. Uh, modifying the DNA of plants, GMOs, this is the GMO that you hear most often about. Applying genomics. So genomics is now used widely in metagenomics, pharmacogenomics, mitochondrial genomics, predicting disease risks at the individual level will allow lifestyle changes before the disease onset. And you can also use gene editing. We have discovered this CRISPR associated nuclease, Cas9. And this actually uses synthetic guide RNA that, it, that will complement with a mutated region. And this nuclease will actually cut it out and allow the repair to occur. Then you can create, you can, you can uh, cure any diseases that stem from mutations. So gene editing may also allow cancer cells to be edited and put back into the patient after to replace the uh, cancer cells because they've been fixed. Also, genome-wide association studies are uh, proving to be pretty useful. What they do is they look at the single nuclei, nucleotide polymorphism, or S SMPs, involved in diseases. <clears throat> and it's called the HapMap Project. HapMap Project is a database of SMPs from hundreds of people all over the world. And then they look at the diseased versus control and look at, look at how the uh, SMP differs. <clears throat> The pharmacogenomic studies effect studies the uh, uh, effects of drugs based on person's DNA sequences. And the changes in gene expression pattern can provide information on drugs toxicity as well as other effects. And metagenomic studies involves collective genomes, studying collective genomes that live in communities like biofilms. And this can identify new species and analyze the effects of pollutants on, on the environment. And also creation of new biofuels involves using microbes to produce biofuels instead of growing, uh, instead of, yeah. So you use uh, crops to mm -hmm. feed to yeast and produce ethanol. And there's another area called my mitochondrial genomics, which is used to trace genealogy as it's passed from the mother. Because father does not contribute a mitochondria. 
we all get our mitochondria from our mothers. <clears throat> Genomics and forensic analysis is also useful. When anthrax was sent to the US senators and they sequenced the anthrax, it was an actual anthrax. They sequenced the anthrax and they found the source to be a national defense lab in Maryland. Um, genomics and agriculture allows us to improve the quality and quantity of the crops. We can use the genomic data to identify the traits linked to genes that are most desirable. And some can even transfer to other crops. So transgenic plum they have produced are resistant to plum pox virus. And uh, as opposed to genomics, proteomics, studies entire proteome or all of the proteins in a cell. DNA is constant, but proteome varies over time, over location, like tissues. And the splicing of the messenger RNA, remember how messenger RNA is processed, it involves splicing, but they have they have a different type of or different patterns of splicing given a single gene. So you can actually create different proteins from one single gene. So, and proteome seeks to study uh, how those things affect the function. Uh, it re requires highly specialized equipment, just like mass spectroscopy for proteomics. It can be used to screen cancers by identifying proteins whose expression differs in a diseased state. And we call something like that a biomarker. Whereas where a set of protein is a protein signature. And these can be screened for possible diseases, but false negative has been high so far and should have been, should have tested for positive, failed to detect, should, should have detect, or should have, shouldn't have positive, but uh, original shouldn't shouldn't haven't been positive, but came back positive and so on. It's not sensitive enough yet. Um, once uh, the NCI has programs to improve uh, on these, they have a, a lot of money spending on it. If you have the if you find the marker, then what? What would you do? Then you have to study. Well, if, if you find a marker, <clears throat> then you have a marker for a disease. If you have the disease, you can then uh, make lifestyle choice, choices. So another area of biotech that is interesting is uh, pro determining protein structures. How do you determine a structure of protein to design an inhibitor to use as a drug for some disease X? Here's a, a, a X-ray crystal structure of trache. That's an NGF receptor on the neurons, and it's bound to it's bound to an inhibitor shown here. Why is this not? Uh, let me see if I can play this. It's not playing. Okay. You could play this file in your lecture notes. Uh, to have the crystal, you must have the proteins expressed, a lot of it, and you can get it from natural sources or you can express yourself. In order to express this protein, you have to clone the DNA and put it into a plasmid. And then uh, that plasmid is the expression construct with your gene inserted in it. Then you transvect the bacteria or yeast or something, and then you produce the protein. Then you isolate the protein. But before that, how do you make your gene insertable into a plasmid? You lift it with PCR, with primer sequences at the end of it, with the restriction site designed to go into a plasmid, just like we have seen earlier. And then you have to grow the proteins all in all, Doing something like that takes a few years, minimally. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's rotating. Yeah. 
Okay. That's all I have today.